Hello and welcome to Showcase, coming to you from our studios in Istanbul. Today, graffiti from Russia, artifacts from Egypt, and the lure of the big screen. I hired you to be an actor, Rick, not a TV cowboy. You're better than that. We delve deep into the 77th edition of the Golden Globes. Painting Jesus. A group of street artists are bringing icons out of the church for a wider audience. We'll tell you how recently discovered mural fragments on the outskirts of Mexico City dodges the inequality. The movie awards season has officially shifted into high gear. The 77th edition of the Golden Globes were recently handed out and it seems like there were not that many surprises. Arguably, the only big surprise regarding the big prizes at the 77th Golden Globes was the best drama motion picture win for 1917. Sam Mendes' World War I epic managed to beat out the favorite of the category, Martin Scorsese's The Irishman. The award marks the English director's second best picture win in 20 years. I hired you to be an actor, Rick, not a TV cowboy. You're better than that. Cinephile filmmaker Quentin Tarantino took home the big prize pack as expected, with Once Upon a Time in Hollywood. His love letter to Tinseltown not only earned him the Best Musical or Comedy Picture Award, but also the Best Screenplay Prize. And the cherry on top for Tarantino was Brad Pitt's win for Best Supporting Actor. Charlie's gonna dig you. I had a fantastic cast. And it's not just the BS fantastic cast. It was a fantastic cast that took it from the page and had to add a slightly different layer than what was just on the page. Have you seen Judy? Renee Zellweger was among those that triumphed at the Golden Globes thanks to her portrayal of Judy Garland in the period piece Judy. Her best drama actress performance win for the acclaimed biopic also marked Zellweger's return to high concept filmmaking. Hi, everybody. It's nice to see you. Y'all look pretty good 17 years later. Um, thank you to the HFPA for inviting me back to the family reunion, um, especially with all these extraordinary ladies this year. I mean it. Your work moves me. No one's laughing now. The other big prize of the night, Best Drama Actor Performance was handed to Joaquin Phoenix for Joker. And even though the veteran actor was expected to win the drama category, the result did surprise old guard movie buffs for having an actor winning the big one with the portrayal of a comic book villain. But I do. Film critic Ali Arukan joins me now. Ali. We were together here talking about the nominations a few weeks ago, and I remember you saying that you weren't that surprised. Mm -hmm. What about uh, last night? Were you surprised by, I mean, 1917, for example? I kind of was. Well, yes, I mean, 1917 winning best film uh, be drama, best film drama was very surprising. Um, here's the interesting thing about the Globes. I mean, there are two interesting things. First of all, even though we say that they don't matter and they, 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 there is no overlap between the people who vote for the Oscars and mm -hmm. vote for the Globes, that remains a fact. However, the Globes are also, in a bizarre way, an audition for possible potential winners in the Oscars because they're shown prime time on major network television. And this is a truncated award season this year. Usually it's, it takes, usually there's about two months between the Globes and the Oscars. In about a month, uh, they'll be giving out the Oscars, so it's a very short season. So 1917 winning is surprising, and the Globes in this case might actually end up being of more effect uh, to the final uh, Oscar result. 
I know you loved Marriage Story. Yes, so, I did. So, were you disappointed by last night's results? Well, I, well, I mean, in a way I was. Laura Dern won a Best <laughs> Supporting Actress. To be perfectly honest, even though people loved her performance in that movie, I think hers is possibly the weakest. I'm not the, I'm not the biggest fan of Laura Dern in, uh, in Marriage Story or this sort of gregarious, larger-than-life Laura Dern performance in this one or in Big Little Lies. I mm. prefer the more subdued Laura Dern sort of thing. But, but yes, it is. It's very interesting because Netflix obviously came, well, almost empty-handed. Mm -hmm. um, so I was disappointed. I was disappointed for Adam Driver. I was disappointed for Marriage Story. Yes, sure. And um, Joaquin Phoenix. Yeah. Well, you, I remember you called his performance a weirdo performance. Yes. And you, you, you said that it was a bit of a showy yes. kind of acting. So, I mean, is this surprising at all, though? Well, it's not surprising. There is acting and there is overacting. And, this is, <laughs> and, and, and then there is over overacting. Like, this, is the, this is the Mount Olympus of overacting. Which Adam Driver wasn't. Well, right? no, he and wasn't. He... Of course. Well, I mean, he, but, but he is like that. You know, Adam Driver is a different sort of animal. Uh, and uh, but this one, in this case, uh, Joaquin Phoenix was definitely, um, uh, you know, uh, uh, kind of crazy in his method and all this, all that stuff. But it's the sort of thing that, you know, Hollywood foreign press likes and, and actors seem to like. And uh, mm -hmm. I, I think he's definitely the front runner uh, at the moment. For the Oscar. Whether, uh, for the Oscar. Whether that's a good thing or not, you know, it's up to you. But how about Robert De Niro in The Irishman? Mm. I mean, isn't it, isn't it a bit overlooked? Like, The Irishman and Robert De Niro. Well, The, the Irishman was majorly <laughs> overlooked, obviously. <laughs> yeah. I mean, uh, you know, Martin Scorsese, Sam Mendes born over Martin Scorsese, which is which kind of tells you all you want to know, all you need to know about the Golden Globes, really. And 1917 over The Irishman, uh, or over Marriage Story. Um, but what does it mean? Well, what does it mean? It, I think what it means right now is uh, that uh, Once Upon a Time in Hollywood is definitely the front runner. This is what it means. If The Irishman had won, now that would have made things a bit more different uh, for me. I, it would have been a two horse race. I think now, I, I read, even though 1917 is possibly more is stronger, is a safer, is a, is a safer, slightly safer bet mm. going into the Oscars. I think this is now once upon a time in Hollywood's um, uh, Oscar to lose. Uh, mm. It's it is now. It's it's turned the 1917 win ironically turned this whole thing into a one horse race, and and that particular horse. A good horse, a fast horse, is once upon a time in Hollywood. How about that for a metaphor? <laughs> Lovely as usual. Thank and you. Netflix, what's happening? I mean, last time we spoke about it, we said that it was changing the game. Netflix, obviously, they've been doing great. But then, what yeah. happened last night? I mean, what does this mean? Well, I mean, you know, they're going to they're going to work very hard to spin this. I mean, they've been I've been looking at the trades and looking at. Um, Twitter and a bunch of other places. And, uh, you know, it's going to be very hard for them to spin this. It is a bit of a disappointment for them, but you've still got the Guild Awards coming up. You've got the Directors Guild and the Producers Guild. You've got Screen Actors Guild and everything. So I think they're going to win a bunch of awards because these are very, these, I mean, uh, The Irishman and Marriage Story, I would say they're very sort of, um, you know, actor and director movies. And I think they're going, they're going to get some, some uh, love from the guilds whether they'll get some love from the Oscars is, uh, well, it's not Let's as see. safe a bet as I said. Let's see. Okay, well, I'm actually curious to see what Netflix is going to do in 2020 because, yeah. I mean, in the last few years, I've, yeah. been, a, I've been a strong fan of their productions. Yeah. So, as we enter the 2020s, the cinematic calendar actually looks promising enough to keep movie fans eagerly anticipating with a wide range of productions. And now... Here is what the first year of the new decade has to offer for cinephiles. Your skills die with your body. One big movie franchise that is making a comeback this year is James Bond. No Time to Die, the 25th film in the series, sees the agent with a license to kill coming back into the espionage game after his retirement in the previous installment. Ever since its successful reboot in the mid-2000s, the 007 films have been receiving nothing but praise, and No Time to Die is expected to do more of the same. 
spirit is evident. Fantasy films that empower women will also try to find their audience in 2020. The period epic, Mulan, is being highly anticipated by fans. Not only due to it being a live-action remake of the Disney cartoon classic of the same name, but also for having a female director and screenwriting team behind it. A sequel that was more than 30 years in the making, Top Gun Maverick finds Tom Cruise reassuming the role that helped his career reach blockbusting proportions. Will this follow-up bring Cruz back to his former days of glory? We shall wait and see. DC Entertainment will do its best to get ahead of its rival Marvel with Birds of Prey, the big-budget ensemble piece featuring its female superheroes and villains. And critics agree that the inclusion of cult favorite character Harley Quinn could be the key to help DC score much-needed major points at the box office. So Ali, uh, our movie buff, Ali Jan just told us that DC Entertainment will do its best to get ahead of Marvel with Birds of Prey scoring much-needed uh, points at the box office. Do you think they will succeed in doing this with Birds of Prey? Well, you know, Birds of Prey is going to probably be a success. I mean, it's coming in a month and a bit. I think it's a f opening in February. I don't particularly think that Harley Quinn as a, as a character is that great a box office draw. I mean, she was in Suicide Squad as well and, you know, whatever. Um, <laughs> but I think what's interesting is Wonder Woman 1984. Uh, Wonder Woman was a huge uh, box office hit uh, a few years ago, two years ago, three years ago, whatever it was. I mean, it's all a blur now with all these superhero f films. Um, when I was growing up, having one was just this great, wonderful thing. And now we've get a new one every month. So um, anyway, uh, Wonder Woman 1984, I think that's going to be a, a bigger hit. Uh, okay, how about The Eternals? Do you think uh, Chloe Zhao will um, nail this transition to big uh, budget blockbuster? Well, here's the thing. I think after this whole Endgame, Avengers Endgame business, um, this year Marvel is going to have Black Widow um, with Scarlett Johansson, which is a prequel because we know the character dies in, well, died in... Uh, Endgame. That's not a spoiler, by the way, because that was the that's that's the biggest <laughs> film of all time. So if you haven't seen it, you're probably not going to see it anyway. But uh, so there's that. Uh, and the second film is The Eternals. Now I love comics. I love Marvel. I, I love DC. I'm more of a Marvel guy. And uh, ever since I was uh, this tiny, ever so ever since I was, you know, the height of. Tom Cruise. Um, I was, um, not that I'm much taller than him now, but anyway, <laughs> I'll move on. Okay. Uh, yeah. <laughs> but anyway, ever since I was a kid, I've been into comics. Um, even I have no idea who the Eternals are. I have this sort of an idea of who they are. Um, they've never been very successful, especially on the page. Um, Marvel, is, I think it's wrong to bet against Marvel at this point, but you never know. Um, but yeah, it, it's, it's not as safe uh, uh, a bet as, as, as all these other films uh, used to be. Mm. When it comes to Chloe Zhao, you know, I, I don't particularly think that Marvel films are really director's movies anyway, you know, I mean, you could, you could put any mm. old person there. I mean, so we're talking about all these movies, superhero comics yeah. that are coming up, but then do you think it's 2020 is going to be a good year? Are you hopeful in terms of like um, superhero comics universes? Well, I don't, I don't know. I mean, I am in a way, obviously, you know, rather than superheroes, I think, you know, big, big budget blockbusters are always, you know, a re one of the main reasons why you go to the cinema, and especially now with Netflix and Amazon and a whole bunch of different options. You know, the bigger the film, uh, you know, the more fun you have going to uh, the cinema, seeing it, watching it on the big screen. So you've got, for example, like you just watched uh, you know, we've got the new Bond film coming up. Mm -hmm. uh, he's coming out of retirement. The weirdly, Bond in every single Daniel Craig film has gone into retirement. So I have no idea. There's been five, <laughs> and he's retired five times. I mean, you know. Uh, so you've got that. You've got. Is Mul this a spoiler now? <laughs> well, this is well. Well, anyway. <laughs> well, I think the spoiler is the fact that he keeps coming back. I mean, you know, the guy who's doing his pension must be so frustrated. Um, so you've got that. Mm -hmm. uh, you've got Mulan. Mulan, I think, is a, is an interesting film, not because of the subject matter, uh, because it's just a, it's, it's an old. Disney cartoon, all being like 20, 
22 years mm. ago, whatever. Uh, but they got rid of the talking dinosaur, talking dragon, which I think is a bad idea. You should never get rid of talking dragons. Anyway, um, so uh, it's very interesting because they're going to try and market it for China. The, the, the interesting thing is, obviously, well, the problem for, for Disney is China already produces lavish, extraordinary period epics themselves. So, I'm, so it's going to be very interesting whether the Chinese audiences are going to go for a Chinese epic produced by Americans. Uh, so that's an uninteresting one. Mm -hmm. Maverick, Top Gun, the Top Gun sequel, I'm very much looking forward to that. There's a, there's a bit of a nostalgia into it. Also the fact 30 that... 30 years in the making. Well, they've got 30 <laughs> odd. I mean, you know, I, I remember going to, going to see it with my, with my mother. Um, and um, yeah, it was... And a, it Christopher was a, Nolan. And Christopher Nolan, Tenet, Tenet, I can't wait for Tenet. We only know, know a little about it. Well, I mean, we, you know, it's Tenet, Tenet, the, the word itself, it's a palindrome, oh, crazy, you know, it's obviously got something to do with time travel or, you know, it's kind of Michael Mann crossed with, uh, you know, science fiction-y, you know, sort of Michael Mann sort of film. That's the only thing that we know really from the, from the trailers. Uh, but it's Christopher Nolan. Um, you know, and his, his last film, Dunkirk, was 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 a masterpiece. This is pretty much every single film that he's made. I, I used to be a very, I used to be an anti Nolan guy, but after since ever since Interstellar, I've, I've, I've turned around on him. Very much looking forward to it. Okay, well, Ali Ali Khan, it was good to have you. Thank you so much. Good to be here. Thank you. Graffiti has come a long way. It was once a method for street gangs to mark their territory, while today it's a rich medium for unrestricted expression of ideas. And for a group of street artists in Russia, it's also a great way to work for a holy cause. A hoodie, a face mask, spray cans and a public wall. These are the typical features of a street artist. The non-typical part of this scene is the subject of the work. Professional icon painter Alexander Tsipkov draws Jesus Christ and other religious icons across public spaces in Moscow as a tribute to the beauty of Christian art. If something clicks in a person when they see the graffiti, and if they come to God in a temple, this will be my victory. He's doing this as part of a project called After Icon, launched by a group of artists the focus of the initiative is to bring Christian art into everyday life. But what they're doing is actually illegal. I'm not a vandal. You need to understand that vandalizing bus stops, fences, cars, some very good architectural buildings, this is not about me. This is about some other guys. I like drawing. I draw what must be in this country among these people historically must be here, was here, and will be here. Well, Tsipkov and his fellow artists might not have a legal permit for their wall paintings, but they do have the Orthodox Church's blessing. I don't think we should stop the guys, because they have the desire to somehow express their attitude and their wish that these sacred images be visible to many people. The only thing I told them personally is if you want to paint something on the walls, then choose a more decent place for this, where they would not be violated and would not be defiled by someone. And on the more legal end of the project, the artists redecorate destroyed churches with their artworks. Thousands of temples were abandoned after the revolution, after the war. I think they must be under restoration. We couldn't have just passed by and do nothing. We wanted to decorate them somehow. And not to forget that we have a lot of beautiful architecture in the country that is not being taken care of. Through all these efforts, they hope to make Christian art part of the Russian contemporary art scene. But one also wonders if they could make street art an acceptable form of worship. Tutankhamun captured imaginations around the world when his tomb was unearthed by British explorer Howard Carter in 1922. But now, almost a century later, a travelling exhibition of his most prized artefacts has reignited audiences' passion for the boy king's anti-hero persona. You don't need to love archaeology 
Ti like Titan Hamun or Tit as some call him. When the famous Egyptian pharaoh took the throne as a young boy, he too would have preferred to play with his ships and daggers rather than sit through an archaeology exhibit. But Tit was not your average pharaoh. And it is exactly this that makes his travelling tomb capture the imagination of archaeology lovers and loathers alike. Aged nine, when he took the throne from his father, Tit was a sickly, disabled boy who loved swords and toy sailboats. He died in adolescence and unlike his powerful predecessors, Tit was buried in a second-hand coffin in an average-sized, non-royal tomb. Inside were dozens of sentimental, handcrafted ornaments meant to accompany Tut to his afterlife. For the ancient Egyptians, this was not the end of human being life, but it was a new start, a start of a journey to the afterlife. And like any traveler, he would need to be well equipped for the journey. Along with his toys, there is also golden jewelry, elaborate ornaments, and towering wooden statues representing the boy king. A reminder that, despite his youth and fragility, the young Tut ruled over one of the wealthiest and most powerful civilizations on earth. It's the end of a long tour for the young pharaoh, stopping in over 10 cities around the globe. The exhibition became France's most visited of all time, with an attendance of over 1.4 million. But despite its popularity, this will be the last time Tut's treasures will ever travel the world before returning to Egypt. Time for the famous young boy king and his belongings to be formally put to rest. Fragments of pre-Aztec murals recently unearthed on the outskirts of what was once the largest city of the Americas are adding to mounting evidence that even commoners enjoyed the finer things in life. Yahaira Jaquez has more. Each year, millions of tourists visit the ruins of Teotihuacan outside of Mexico City to see and climb its giant pyramids. But further south of the towering monuments, archaeologists and workers have unearthed fragments of pre-Aztec murals shedding light on how commoners lived in the ancient metropolis that thrived from about 100 BC to 550 AD. Reuters correspondent David Alira Garcia is on the story. The ancient city of Teotihuacan was once the largest city in the Americas. It had massive temples, massive pyramids, in fact the biggest pyramid you can see behind me in the distance. But what's maybe most remarkable about this city, according to more and more archaeological research, is how regular people here lived, with relatively low levels of inequality and access to a wide range of imported goods, even luxury goods. Archaeologists have found jade and shells from Mexico's Pacific and Gulf coasts in parts of the city where the working class lived showing that at a time when daily life in other ancient cities was marked by a tiny elite lording over poor or enslaved masses, most of Teotihuacan's estimated 100,000 inhabitants fared far better. The most striking example of the relatively low levels of inequality at Teotihuacan is the presence of some two to 3,000 stone multi-family apartment complexes that are scattered all across the city and where most of the people lived. That's in stark contrast to ancient Rome, ancient Greece, or even the big Mayan cities where most people did not have this kind of housing. 90% of Teotihuacanos lived in those apartment complexes, which featured open-air courtyards, built-in drainage systems, and murals. And according to Ruben Cabrera, the archaeologist who pioneered the most complete excavation to date of a Teotihuacan district called La Ventilla, Teotihuacan's mass housing is unprecedented in antiquity. Había gente pobre y había gente en de alto nivel económico. There were poor people and there were people of a high economic level, but that happens in all societies. But 
It wasn't as pronounced, for example, as in Rome or in other places where there is the dominated group and the dominant group. In more than a century of excavations, no evidence of slavery has been found in Teotihuacan, a city archaeologists say was very diverse. Inhabited by multi-ethnic migrant communities that settled there after two major volcanic eruptions. Experts say the refugees who fled their destroyed homes were likely attracted to Teotihuacan through work programs in a city that placed a higher value on social groups than individuals, resulting in social classes less sharply divided by access to resources. That's it on this episode of Showcase. Our YouTube channel has so much more from the world of culture and the arts. I'm Ilfere Thanks for watching. Bye for now.